Good afternoon, folks. I'm John Budden, and welcome to Money Talk. Here's the lineup for today's show. We start with Dave Sally of the Ottawa Business Journal, then to my weekly chat with Matt Hendricks, Senior Vice President, National Sales at Sprott Asset Management. After the break, we'll go to Michael Hainsworth, who will give us a wrap-up of the past week's trading. And on to David Prince, founder of Harbinger Capital Markets Research. And after the news, my interview with Steve Higgins, Director, Storage and Refining Solutions at the Royal Canadian Mint here in Ottawa. Now, after the final break, very interesting interview about the next evolution of technology from virtual and augmented reality to artificial intelligence and robotics. Technology is advancing at a rapid rate, and Gene Munster, managing partner at Loop Ventures, says now is the time to invest in the next evolution. BNN's Amber Canwar discusses opportunities and themes with the former longtime and highly regarded Apple analyst who says, technology is laying the groundwork for a new life paradigm for humanity. But first, let's go to Dave Sally at the Ottawa Business Journal. I'm joined by Dave Sally of the Ottawa Business Journal. Dave, more big news from the city's tech sector this week as one of Ottawa's best-known software companies announced it was undergoing a strategic review after a number of outside suitors expressed significant interest in acquiring the firm. In other tech news, a local company on a mission to revolutionize the hearing health industry says it's raised millions in a new venture capital financing. Well, John, let's start with Ottawa-based software maker Halogen, whose stock soared late this past week amid reports the firm is being targeted by potential buyers. Halogen's shares jumped 25% last Thursday on the TSX after it said there was significant interest in the company from outside suitors. Halogen did not name any of those potential suitors, but the company, which sells human resources software solutions, says it will create a special committee to explore various strategic alternatives aimed at maximizing shareholder value. Now, under such a process, typically, a company could look at finding higher bids, selling assets, or continuing with its existing business plan. The uh, special committee will be comprised of independent directors and will be led by former Cogno CEO Rob Ash, who joined Halogen's board in 2013. Halogen was originally founded in 1996, The company went public in 2013 with a $55 million IPO that was hailed by analysts. It remains one of the city's most valuable publicly traded companies. The company's software-as-a-service business model effectively involves renting out and servicing its talent management product. This means the business is not based on big deals, but rather on accumulating a steady stream of contracts to generate recurring revenue and continued growth. Halogen employs more than 400 people in Ottawa, And in its most recent financial reports, the company reported an $800,000 quarterly profit, up from a $3.8 million loss a year earlier. And Dave, another Ottawa tech company added to the city's ongoing VC funding bonanza this past week. You got it, John. Uh, The latest local firm to grab big bucks from venture capitalists is Clearwater Clinical. The firm is based in Wellington West and makes medical devices, And it boldly says its goal is to revolutionize the hearing health industry. Last Thursday, the firm announced it has landed $6 million in Series A funding. The latest round was led by Toronto-based Whitecap Venture Partners and BDC Capital Healthcare Venture Fund. It brings Clearwater Clinical's total funding to date to $9.5 million. Now, Clearwater Clinical's signature product is called Shoebox Audiometry, The company says it is the world's first clinically validated tablet-based audiometer. The company says this tablet makes it possible for virtually anyone in a quiet environment to perform tests that can lead to early detection of hearing-related conditions. Clearwater's client base includes customers involved in industrial workplace testing, retail, pharmaceuticals, and hearing care multinationals. Besides Shoebox, Clearwater also operates a second division called Modica, This is a medical camera app designed to allow physicians to securely record, archive, manage, and share photos and videos directly from their iPhones. And Dave, what's coming up on OBGA's radar? Well, John, do you ever wonder why some companies are more innovative than others? 
or why some firms command so much loyalty? Well, a new workshop tomorrow at Invest Ottawa will help answer those questions and others and offer entrepreneurs tips on how to build a solid foundation for their business. Longtime business coach Antoine Carrier will be on hand to share his insights at this free event aimed at entrepreneurs of all stages. It takes place Monday morning, 10 a.m., at Invest Ottawa's new headquarters in the Innovation Centre at 7 Bayview Drive. Well, Dave, thanks for a great update. Have a good week, and we will talk to you not next week, but the following week. You too, John. Thanks a lot. Now to Matt Hendricks, Senior Vice President of National Sales at Sprott Asset Management. As always, it's great to be joined by Matt Hendricks, who is Senior Vice President of National Sales at Sprott Asset Management. How are you, Matt? I'm very well, John. How are you doing today? Okay. It's going to warm up, apparently. We're going to have balmy weather in the coming week. And we've, of course, got a new president coming in in the United States. Markets started off euphoric after the election, and there was a tremendous run in equities. But since the beginning of the year, we've seen the gold market perk up, and it is the evidence that you need a number of sleeves in your portfolio to deal with all of the uncertainty that's out there. Well, that's for sure, John. It's going to be tougher than ever for investment advisors to allocate here. I mean, these last eight years, we had to wait to see what the Fed or uh, the Bank of Japan, European Central Bank would do. And now it's whatever Donald Trump's Twitter account does can uh, change the markets either way. So this is going to be a crazy ride. More important than ever that you have a diversified portfolio that is nimble and has defense built in. And we certainly have that as Sprott. And as well, our income solutions are continuing to dominate here. Our private debt, Scott Colburn's uh, bond fund is doing fantastic. So maybe it's time to shift away a little bit from equities and uh, and more into uh, solid, solid alternative income. And it's really important to have proactive managers. Now, we all know that diversification is a credo for defensive investing, but proactive managers, in my opinion, are really the key. We've always said that that active management will definitely outperform passive management. And, you know, some years it's not quite as in favor. Like I would definitely say 2016, passive investing did a little bit better than active investing. But overall, over long periods of time, active management is the way to go. And I think 2017 is going to be a year that uh, definitely echoes that thought. How has Eric Nuttall been doing Well, he ended the year number one in Canada on a year-to-date, one year, and a three-year basis. He just blew it out of the park. He was just shy of 70% net of fee, outperforming his index by 10% per year. So Nuttall has definitely outperformed. Again, talk about active management. He beat his benchmark by 30% last year. So there is great opportunity, we believe, in the oil patch uh, this year with the OPEC deal going on. And, you know, Nuttall is calling for $60 oil this year and 65 next year, which I think is pretty conservative numbers. And he still believes there could be at least a 50 to 60 percent upside on some of the names out there. Well, how do listeners and investors get in touch with you to uh, learn more about the Sprott strategies? John, we have a toll-free number that is 866-299-9906. And we have a great website at Sprott.com. Thanks very much, Matt. That's a great update. All the best, John. We'll go to a break, and when we come back, Michael Hainsworth of our affiliate BNN, and he'll give us a wrap-up of the week's trading. Stay with us, folks. You are listening to 580 CFRA. Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. We've got 25 seconds left to go in the day. 78 points on the board thanks to the money changers and the gold stocks. At the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, investors are buying back into the FANG stocks today. Yeah, sinking their teeth into it. Sorry, I had to. And at the corner of Broad and Wall Street, to the New York Stock Exchange, we're getting ready to end a trading week that pretty much ended where it started. The regular trading day is now over. The close begins now. All right, so let's start with Toronto and the TSX Composite Index with about 380 million shares crossing the tape, closing 79 points higher today, half of 1%. For the entire week, though, still underwater by two-fifths of 1%. But green on the screen today, thanks to banks, a bullion, 
and barrels, the three key pillars propping up Bay Street, were all working in positive territory today, combined adding about 51 points to the composite's more than 70-point gain. Half a 1% increase on the money group. We're looking at the material girls up by a full percent and a half percent increase today on energy. Now, as far as how gold and crude oil have been performing, the materials sector's uh, underlying commodity at 1198.20, down now by a buck sixty or about a tenth of one percent over the last month up by two point three percent we were speaking earlier today with Clement Gignac over at AI Financial he was in Toronto today speaking with Finance Minister Bill Morneau about the prospects of uh, an economic reaction to Trump being elected president building an economic wall south of the border and he suggests that about five percent of our total portfolio not equity portfolio total portfolio ought to be exposed to gold as a hedge against uh, not just inflation but also the geopolitical political risks that come with a man who won't put down his Twitter machine. Now on the other element that we're looking at, crude oil, production last week, the most since last April. Inventories we reported to you a little bit earlier, uh, coming in f three times greater than estimate, a buildup of 4.1 million barrels. We also saw U.S. dollar strength playing a role in what you're looking at here, and Iraq confirming a plan to cut production, while the Saudis apparently are showing some evidence they actually are as well. 49 cents lighter now, 50 cents on a down tick to $52.51 in electronic trading. The influential issues, Royal, CNQ, Kushtard, Sun Life and Scotia. Royal up by 75 cents and a 43 cent gain for Scotia. In New York, three stocks up to the two that were down on the S&P 500. And that broader basket of stocks with a four point gain, dead money through the course of the week at 22.74. Facebook. One of the most influential issues. Comcast was in there too. Wells Fargo did not exactly shoot the lights out with its quarterly report. Paul Bagman will tell us about that. But an 81 cent gain nonetheless, good for 1.5%. Amazon and Netflix, talking about the FANG stocks. There's Facebook up by a buck 72. Amazon 350 and 452 gain on Netflix today. So, with that in mind, how did the NASDAQ Composite Index do? 5,574, a gain of 26 points today for the week, up by one and a third percent. Quick look at the blue chip basket, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, closing the day at 19,885, down five points for the week, down about a tenth of one percent. Now to David Prince, founder of Harbinger Capital Markets Research, for his insights. Harbinger's David Prince is with us as we looked at the commodity sector. I want to focus on lumber as some of the base metals plays uh, as well. So we look at where lumber is at this point, right. where it goes from here based upon the Americans. But we also need to bring copper into that equation. Sure. So what I'm going to do is start with that lumber price just to get people uh, clear on what, what has happened. Right. Is that we need to look at the lumber because it gives you a much better sense about the building in the United States. So we have a big issue called the softwood lumber issue, and that's going to be definitely a, uh, an issue for investors over this next six to nine months for mm -hmm. sure um, with the new administration. But the reality is the lift in lumber prices have not been as big as one would have expected given the volume of housing that we're seeing in the United States. So um, certainly it's being supplied well. The price, though, is amazing to me that it stayed at this $304 per thousand board feet. So there hasn't been the, the big clamoring. Well, what's really got the Americans upset is because they're claiming that we're dumping it at a much lower cost to us um, and because it's crown owned and there's a whole bunch of issues. But we're going to find out. And that's why the stocks, unfortunately, have underperformed the American counterpart. So with that in mind, would you want to get a take a wait-and-see approach to what Mr. Trump may or may not do, or do you use this as a buying opportunity? I, I would be looking at the American lumber producers, because no matter how it works, you're going to be going after the, the Boise's and things of this, the Louisiana Purchase, etc. So that's a more safe entry point if you're looking at a housing recovery that's going to accelerate next year or this year in the United States, then that's what I'd be doing. Copper is considered the, the exactly. metal with a PhD yeah. in economics because it sort of attracts the world economy. But zinc's been outperforming it. And I think that's a really valid point that what you're seeing is that there's been a big anticipation of a cyclical return with this Trump election and what has been happening, in fact, is that the base metals have been so wrung out over the last several years because they've either been closed, the finances haven't worked, but they have been under a lot of pressure. And then in 2016, a change in attitude occurred and things started to balance out. And we are now seeing a pretty robust demand for zinc. One, in fact, that's a multi-year high at this point. 
I wonder if this is a supply issue more than a demand issue because is. we've got a lot more copper mines coming online and we know that China stockpiles the commodity as well at a much greater pace than you would see of zinc, which also has industrial uses. Bingo. And I think that's what you've nailed, exactly the point that because we shut in so many of those mines that there is really a, a supply shortage at, the, at this stage. It's not a huge gain, but it's enough of that marginal gain that's pushing them. So in Canada, that's why you're seeing stocks like Hudson Bay and L uh, Lundin way outperform the market over this last, well, even four months. So if you owned a, a Hud Bay or a Lundin, would you sell on the strength? Not yet. I think it's too early. I think you've still got a room to go. I'm not saying that we can't have a short-term pullback. Mm -hmm. That's not the way I'm looking at it. It looks to me like those types of stocks are going to be winners throughout the year. Okay, so this is a longer-term buy-in. Oh, for sure. What's the, what's the catalyst that you need to see to be able to say it's time to sell? Well, I, I would say if the U.S. dollar rolled over sharply, then we would be seeing a slowdown in that U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the way to measure it. Oh, yeah, well, there's, there's the charts. You can see on the charts. They've been everybody's sweethearts in the last couple of months. You can but, see them. Nobody else can okay, see them. Okay, sorry. There we are. Okay. Uh, but the main point is that what you're dealing with is that uh, it's going to go higher. What you need to see is a longer-term chart in both of them, and then you'll appreciate just the fact that they have come down. All right, let, let, let's put uh, Nick on graphics up to the test. Ah, there we are. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. So it d does give us a greater sense. Of, as yeah, I mean, we're really breaking out here in this last year, and that's really important. Okay. So from there, what we want to be looking at in terms of the, the metals, uh, obviously you want to look at what the, the other big one, and that's gold. Okay. I spoke with Clement Gignac over at IA Financial earlier today after his meeting with the finance minister. Uh -huh. And, of course, the, neither the finance minister nor Mr. Gignac would flat out say that, yes, we have to be worried about Trump for this, this, and this, although Mr. Gignac certainly had a lot of interesting things to say about how we position ourselves. And one of the things he suggested is that we all need to use gold as a hedge, not just against inflation if Trump throws a lot of money at the economy, but the idea that he could create some sort of international incident via Twitter that would jack up the the price of gold itself. 5% of your total investable money should be set aside, he says. Not equities, investable total. What do you think? There's never been um, a reason not to own 5%, okay? That, that's the old insurance clause. And having insurance is not a bad thing. It certainly applies to some conservative accounts. So how do you do that if you're a Canadian? And that's really what's happened in the last several years is that Unfortunately, a lot of the gold mining companies have not been well run. They've been poor at giving you decent returns. And certainly we've seen massive write downs from places like Barrick and Gold Corp. Mm -hmm. You saw another one this week again that Gold Corp sold off one of its Mexican things. So when you look at what's happened in terms of the gold price to the gold stocks, you can see the gold stocks are a hit. And I will tell you, uh, the one that I have I've put in my own account was, was this Klondex, which is the KDX. That, and the reason I did that is because you have to know where the jurisdiction is. If you're buying mines, mm -hmm. you have to know the management. You've got to know where the jurisdiction. It's too complicated for a lot of people, whereas you can buy some of these units that are participation units that will give you actual exposure to the commodity, gold itself. Without actually having to physically buy gold. Gold, you, but you get that exposure right. to it. So it's like a Canadian hedge on the, um, on the U.S. dollar. Basically, that's what you're doing. But that said, um, when you're looking at some of these stocks, they did get ahead of themselves. They certainly had some profit taking the last couple of weeks. It looks to me that because the seasonality is favoring them over the near term, that it looks like we're going to get a little more lift out of the, uh, the prices here on the gold bullion itself. 1250 so is sort of what I'm looking at. If your point is, is that 5% total exposure to gold bullion is a standard insurance policy that sure. we all ought to have, in a Trump administration environment, are you advising that we expand that and overweight gold? Uh, not yet, and not until I figure out what exactly he's doing or anybody else is doing. I mean, the, the problem for me is that you can make all kinds of uh, projections, but at this stage, we don't know, because the surprise may be it works. Mm. And uh, then wouldn't that be a waste of time? So let's not get too carried away. The one key thing to really overweight the gold would be a measure of inflation coming back. And if you're looking at those measures currently, you're not seeing that pricing pressure come in. 
But what is mandatory is that obviously if that accelerates, mm -hmm. we saw the average hourly uh, wages go up in, the, in December, you see a continuance of that. You see the commodity prices picking up, then yes, I'm going to be a lot more aggressive at overweighting gold. Want to go to Switzerland when we come back? Sure. All right. Uh, we're going to take a brief break. When we come back, we'll look at what David's keeping an eye on, including for next week, Davos. Okay, folks, we'll go to the news. And when we come back, my interview with Steve Higgins, who is Director, Storage and Refining Solutions at the Royal Canadian Mint. Stay with us. You are listening to 580 CFRA. I'm joined today by Steve Higgins, who is the Director of Storage and Refining Solutions at the Royal Canadian Mint here in Ottawa. How are you, Steve? I'm great. Thanks for having me back, John. Well, it's a pleasure, and we have got a surreal environment, and we've seen an amazing election in the United States and a correction in the gold market during the last quarter of 2016. And now gold seems to be acting better, and uh, along with it, silver. But the last time we talked, I started off by asking you about your background and your role at the Royal Canadian Mint. So let's, for our audience, do that again. Okay, great. I'm a director of storage and refining solutions at the Mint. I um, helped the Mint start the Mint's exchange traded receipt program. So that's a program that has gold and silver stored at the Mint and traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. We did that back in November 2011 was the initial public offering. And then I've been managing the program since, including the launch of a, a silver program that's designed exactly the same. Well, tell us about the Royal Canadian Mint. It's been around a long time. Yeah, the Mint's been in its location on Sussex ever since 1908, where we started to refine gold just shortly afterwards. The first coins were struck there. At the time, it was actually the Royal Mint out of the UK, and it was only later that we became a separate entity. First, we were Department of Finance, and then later were our own separate crown corporation as we exist today. But we've got four main business lines. We obviously make all of the Canadian circulation coins, so your nickels, dimes, quarters, loonies, and toonies. And we do collector coin business, so we've got beautiful works of art that we spend lots of time designing new features, holographic images, making metals come up in absolutely different colors and, and different effects. So we're world-leading in some of that work. We produce coins out of Winnipeg for countries around the world. So we'll work for, oh, a dozen or so countries in any given year and have worked for about 80 countries over the years. And then in Ottawa, we've got precious metals business. So we've got a refinery. We refine gold and silver, dore that comes from the mines or recycled gold and silver. And we turn that into high purity bullion products. So we produce all the gold and silver maple leaf bullion coins in Ottawa. And we also do bullion products like the London Good Delivery Bars and bars to be delivered to the Chicago's Metals Exchange and, and the like. Well, I thought what we dwell on today is the exchange-traded receipts. And they are really a very different investment vehicle than gold shares or ETFs like the GLD Spider Trust on the New York Stock Exchange. Could you... Tell us in some detail about your exchange-traded receipts, both in silver and gold. Okay. So an exchange-traded receipt, a bit of a different structure than what is out there. It's obviously not an equity like a mine. So in a mine, you own a share in a, a company that's going to go and do activities to find gold, take it out of the ground, and then when they sell that gold, they'll, they'll make revenue. In this case, all an investor owns is directly precious metals. There are other types of products out there that track precious metals price by having a fund company or mutual fund or an entity like a trust that owns precious metals and then the investors own shares in them. An exchange trade receipt is kind of one layer simpler where investors actually directly own the precious metals and not part of an entity. So investors directly hold that and then we keep all of that gold and silver in our Ottawa facility. It can be withdrawn as required, but in terms of structure, it's traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and it's 
effectively a receipt for the precious metals that you own. And it's different from the GLD Spider Gold Trust in that it's more of a direct pure play in the sense that there are not intermediaries in between the investor and their precious metal. Yeah, good question. So the grantor trust structure that the GLD is set up as, investors obviously own shares or or units in that organization, and then they have custodial and subcustodial arrangements with people that store the precious metals on their behalf in London, and that's what the investors own. They they work pretty hard to try to, to keep their gold price very close to the metal price. I guess the difference is there aren't as many entities and parties involved, and there's a couple of advantages to that. I mean, one thing is it allows us to offer the receipts a little bit cheaper. So we're a little bit cheaper than the Spider Gold shares in terms of fees. And I guess in the event that if you're buying gold as a, a kind of an insurance product and in the event that the unthinkable happens and you get an event where you really, really require it and there's, there's a bit of a breakdown in some of the financial mechanisms, then you're going to want to know that your gold product works. And the question is, will all of these parties stand up to that that issue in, in that event? Or are, are you better off to have gold held in Canada at effectively a crown corporation than a, another type of entity? And I think in some cases, we've designed it so uh, investors have just the precious metals with as few additional risks as we can other than the gold and silver price. Well, the annual management fee is very economical because it takes into account storage and Could you tell us what that fee is for both gold and silver? Yeah. So for gold, it's 0.35% per year. And for silver, it's 0.45% per year. Silver costs a little bit more. It takes up more room in our vault per dollar value, and it's more work when you audit it. So we end up charging a little bit more there. But if you look around, I think Spider Gold shares is at 0.4%. So what is that, a seventh more expensive? And then a number of the silver programs are a little bit more expensive as well. And part of that's just the Mint runs all of its own vaults and its own facility, so we don't go out and hire custodians because we are the custodian. So it's a little bit cheaper for us. I used the term earlier, surreal, and there is a great deal of potential for wildcard events around the world in the coming year. We've got elections in Europe. We've got the new Trump administration And we just don't know what China is going to do. They seem to be keeping their cards fairly close as the new administration in the U.S. comes into place. So speaking for myself, and our listeners know that I'm a certified gold bug, and so they will accordingly fade my opinion. But gold is useful as an alternative currency, that is physical gold, physical silver, and it has proved its worth over the centuries in times of deflation, inflation, and currency devaluation. As you know, I do advise family offices and institutions on the vehicles and consider your exchange-traded receipt to be one of the simplest, most economical ways for people to hold gold bullion. Now, could you describe the redemption process and the ways that people can exchange their receipt into physical gold or silver? Sure. So physical gold and silver redemptions, they're available every month. So the 15th of each month or the next business day, if it's on a weekend, is a redemption date. Investors can withdraw their gold or silver subject to some minimums. And the minimums are lower than most, if not all, of the the products that are available, at least in Canada. But they're still relatively significant. So it's 10,000 units for gold or 5,000 units for silver as a minimum, which works out to be about 107 ounces of gold or about 3,000 ounces of silver. Subject to those minimums, every month people can actually withdraw the metal. They talk to their broker They will get a form that they need to fill out. All we're looking for is what kind of format do you want for your gold? So you can take it in the one-ounce coins, the mid-sized bars or the large trade bars, 400 ounces for gold or 1,000 ounces for silver. And then we will put it on the armored car carrier of your choice and send it to you 
per your delivery instructions. We're just looking for the information. What products do you want? When and where do you want it delivered and by whom? And then the bank certifies that, yes, you do own the units. And then we withdraw the metal and deliver it to you and cancel your receipts. And in the case of storage, there are some very large family office institutional investors who actually buy the physical gold bullion and store it at your facility on Sussex at the Royal Canadian Mint. Could you describe that process and the minimum amount that an investor would have to have to be able to take advantage of that? Yeah, we offer gold uh, and silver storage. The uh, minimums are kind of hefty. We're looking for at least a few million dollars in order for it to economically make sense for someone to store precious metals directly with us in a storage account. An exchange trade receipt is an, an option for or pretty much any size. But if someone wants to hold a, a specific set of bars aside for themselves, they can do that, subject to a few million dollar minimum. Our clients tend to be either asset management firms, a number of the financial institutions, but we also do have some gold that we keep, particularly for high wealth individuals, so some family offices and the like. And of course, Sprott Asset Management store their gold at the Royal Canadian Mint. Yeah, that's right. They store all the gold and silver underlining, the gold physical products, so the physical gold trust and the physical silver trust are in the custody of the Royal Canadian Mint, and as well as precious metal from the mutual funds. I'll make one of my outlandish predictions that over the next 10 years, we will see more pension funds, endowments, institutions deciding to have a portion of their assets invested in gold bullion, gold bullion being very different than gold shares. Gold shares are much more volatile, and I guess that one should probably go and see the new movie with Matthew McConaughey called Gold, which is about Briex, which is uh, quite sobering uh, as to what can happen when gold shares go the wrong way. Yeah, I'm interested to see the new movie. Uh, I'm going to set some time aside and and take my wife, and we're going to go and watch Briax. It was a story that uh, I'd certainly grew up with. So, do you have anything to add? Well, I'm not sure about the prediction on on the pension funds, I, so I can't say with any certainty. But I can tell you, I've had more conversations as of late than we have in the past. So, you could be right. People are paying attention, at least taking a look at what some of their options are in the pension space. Steve, for listeners who would like to receive more information on the gold ETR and the silver ETR, could you give us the symbols and let us know the website and the ways that they can develop more knowledge on these investments? Yeah, absolutely. The Mint has a dedicated website, reserves.mint.ca. So you can go in there. If you look for the information statement, that's got all the information about the program, discloses all the risks, and talks about all their rights. Another option, of course, always is to speak to your financial advisor about the products. And the symbols are MNT and MNS. So MNT is gold and MNS is silver. And MNT.U is the same thing, only in U.S. dollars. And MNS.U is silver, but in U.S. dollars. Excellent update. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll talk again soon. All the best. Thanks very much, John. I really enjoyed being on the show. Okay, folks, we'll go to a break, and after that, we'll conclude today's show with Amber Canwar of our affiliate BNN in discussion with Gene Munster, Managing Partner at Loop Ventures. Stay with us. You are listening to 580 CFRA. Gene Monster has been a frequent guest with us in the past, previously during his time with Piper Jaffrey. He is now the managing partner with Loop Ventures, and he joins us this morning from Minneapolis. Gene, nice to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, good to see you. You know, we're talking short term about government plans, but you're looking at a technology world over the next decade, 20 years out, that's going to look remarkably different, affects everything, certainly the jobs picture around the world. What is the biggest takeaway for you on the trends with VR? Because I was looking at your numbers, and you're expecting massive adoption with uh, users of virtual reality in the years to come. 
Well, virtual reality is one of the four themes that we're really banking on, and the second is augmented reality, artificial intelligence, and robotics. And so the combination of those four themes we think are as big or bigger than what the Internet was or mobile. And so that was enough to get me to move from what I was doing. had a, a great time at Piper, but this was a bigger opportunity. And so maybe talking a little bit more specifically about VR, we're still in the early stages. Our research, we recently surveyed 500 people in the U.S., and only one in ten had even tried VR. And the average person, once they try it, they only use it about six times a year. And so we're still so early in this that uh, it's hard to imagine this being a world that's going to really change us. But just to put some context around what the change is going to be, is eventually the virtual world is going to be indistinguishable from the, the, the real world. And at that point, people will feel more comfortable at doing what we call in teleporting. And we think this is going to be a huge adoption phase for consumers in the next, as you said, five to ten years. So it's interesting that you point out that people who use it don't tend to go back. How do you distinguish between being early in a technology and, and a technology that's not really gaining much traction? Well, it's the key issue here is that we have both a hardware issue and a content issue. And I think that this is very different than 3D because the experience is very different. This is mm -hmm. not just enhancing the existing experience. This is just a whole new type of experience. And so the, the simple answer is we think as the hardware and the content improves that this will become more mainstream. And uh, that's the bet that we're making. A lot of people, when we've talked to potential uh, companies and investors, think that this is just going to be a fad, that VR is going to be a fad. And we obviously strongly disagree. Uh, we think that 10 years from now, whether you like it or not, I think we're going to be immersed in these VR environments. You know, you um, issued kind of a multi-page manifesto of where you think the world is going. And one of the stats that popped out was that 113 million jobs in the United States are at risk because of these four trends that you see. That's, you know, almost all of the workforce disappearing. Well, it's staggering. And uh, it's about 70 percent of jobs we think are going to go away over time. Uh, I think the U.S. government has a statistic that says that a 40 percent of jobs might be at risk. And this is predominantly driven by artificial intelligence and robotics. And I know that sometimes when you hear those numbers, it sounds uh, kind of a looming type of a prediction. But the reality is, is that we can start spending our time doing things that are more uh, liberating than doing work. And so I think that, yes, robotics will replace things. Artificial intelligence is going to replace lawyers and attorneys and stock analysts. Uh, and so I think that it's going to be a radical change, and we want to be investing ahead of that change. And so if we think of all the time you spent, Gene, covering companies like Apple and the dominance of a product like the iPhone, if we see the world, especially VR and augmented reality, unfold as you expect it to, does that mean an evolution away from a device like the iPhone to new devices that carry a lot more intelligence in them that are more tied to VR? I think that the iPhone as we know it today, there may be a product called the iPhone in five or ten years, but the idea of a, a, some glass and some aluminum in your pocket, that's going to go away. Hmm. We think that the next version of the iPhone, the iPhone 10 that's going to come out this fall, is going to be really an AR iPhone. They're going to hmm. have some 3D mapping capabilities. And so to answer your question is that the phone is going to be the AR device of choice for the next five years, and eventually Apple is going to get into wearables. We're very optimistic about Apple's potential just because they're on, these, on top of these uh, same themes that we're talking about. Just 20 seconds left, but there's been a lot of excitement about Canada's AI scene. You are in the United States. Have you looked north of the border? Definitely. I mean, the two obviously hotbeds would be Toronto and Vancouver. And we're going to be spending a lot of time in Vancouver in part just because there's a lot of great talent there. Also, they draw talent from Amazon and Microsoft headquarters. And so we're excited about spending more time there. Maybe we'll see you here then in the flesh, Gene. <laughs> That'd be great. Gene Munster, the managing partner at Loop Ventures, joining us from Minneapolis. Really fascinating stuff there to watch for sure. Okay, folks, that's it for Money Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back two weeks from today on Sunday, January the 29th at 2 p.m. All best wishes in your investing. I'm John Button, and you are listening to 580 CFRA.